I'm surprised it hasn't knocked more people out because you can barely breathe when you go out there. It's the worst I've ever seen in the Willamette Valley and I've been here my entire life. They're coming to get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master, Mark Warman. Joined by his out of this world cousin, Dougie. Oh, hi, Mark. His apprentice and daughter, Alyssa. Whoa, whoa, stop. And his childhood best friend, Royal. Mark hates everybody. His protege painter, Will Scott. You got one job. This is Graveyard Cars. It is dense out there. If you drive up and down the road, you can hardly see in front of your headlights. That means it's hard on your, your breathing as well. So the fact that we normally wear masks inside, we're wearing them outside too. It's not just made up stuff for TV. We truly have fires here. There's no doubt that it's a rough time right now in our area for forest fires. A lot of people are losing their homes. We just bought a house out in the country, you know, so it's not even that far from our house. And we're at a level one uh, evac. My in-laws are actually staying in a trailer out beside the shop right now because of this, because of the fires, they got evacuated from their home. And my aunt and uncle Doug's dad, they also got evacuated from their home. So we're all praying that it works out and nobody loses their homes. But it is a rough time. Here in town, we're further away, but that fire's coming. But not only that, you have the smoke everywhere. So if you guys recall, uh, last time we looked at Goldberg's 1970 CUDA, the 446 barrel four-speed shaker hood car, double black, black interior, uh, black car. Now in that, we found that the engine and transmission don't match. I'm waiting for Alyssa to get together with me to kind of set up how she's gonna call Bill and let him know. I, I, I know she's dodging me right now, I get it. I, I call her up and she, she's always doing something. I said, why don't you come down right now and we'll just go over it and you can call Bill. Yeah, I will, I will. I'm busy. You know that thing where you pretend like somebody's calling in, oh, I, I gotta grab this call. You've seen that crap before, right? Give me somebody on the phone, give me somebody on waiting. I just need some help right now. I'm getting ready, I got a phone call coming in. Uh, yeah, hang on a second. Um, I know, because I've done it, all right? All right, sir, Melissa speaking. Yep, hold on one second. But the bottom line is, sooner or later, she's gotta call Big Bill and let him know. This week, we're going over the fender tag. Fender tags, data plates are oftentimes very time consuming if you don't know what you're looking at and there's an explanation involved. So I'm gonna let you know right now that you may watch half an hour of this show and say, why are we looking at these numbers? These numbers are important. These numbers tell you how the car started life. They support the inspection that we did on the car. They go hand in hand. It's a birth certificate or in this particular case, it's an autopsy report. This car was built in Los Angeles, California, so there is no broadcast sheet for it. Although a few, I guess, do exist out there. For the most part, they don't. So we're gonna decode this car based on the... Fender tag. Fender tag, that's right. That's good. This is gonna tell us everything we need to know, right? It's a so on a data plate or fender tag, if you will, is what we call it most of the time. It was a stamped piece of steel that had alphanumeric codes in it. And these codes all represented something. They're primarily there to let the guys on the assembly line know exactly what changes were gonna be made and to what car. Consequently, they went with the car when they were done, so it also was a bit like a birth certificate. Now, I brought okay. this book down, but I won't need it. Okay. So, a fender tag reads left to right, that's right, just like a book. Like a book, yeah. like English. Except bottom to top. Weird choice that they went with that. Yeah. Yeah, they did. And so in your left-hand lower corner, what is the very first series of numbers that you see? E87. That represents a 440 engine with three two-barrel Holley carburetors that produces 390 horsepower. So this is a 446-barrel car. If it was a Dodge, they'd call it a 446-pack. 
Same engine, same code. So they're just pack or barrel. Right. Okay, I've heard that. Okay, so a Dodge has a six difficult. pack or a six barrel, a Dodge? Pack. Right, and if it's a Plymouth? Barrel. Very good, all right. We'll keep moving on. Learned that back in season three. All right, the very next one to your right on that line is? Yeah. D21. Now that stands for four-speed manual shifted transmission. In this case, since the car is a 440, whether it has a six barrel on it or a four barrel on it. If it's got a 440 or a hemispherical engine, it gets the Hemi four speed, the big 18 spine heavy duty four speed. If it had a regular 23 spine, it would still be a D21 code. I'm just telling you for your own knowledge, because you'll remember it really well. Yeah, it's yeah. great memory I have. If you're just for the first time picking up a book and decoding one of these, you can be there a while. The sales code in 1971 might represent a different sales code than it would in 1970 or in 1969. So you can't take anything for granted. It's a process of identifying the car, what makes sense on the car, what the car should have on it, and is all of that represented clearly on the fender tag. BS23. That's the model of the car. That's also the first four digits of the vehicle identification number. They want to tie this tag to the car. So you got to have that vehicle identification number that's up in the windshield, match that tag. The vehicle identification number on these Chrysler muscle cars is very informative, especially if you're out in the field and you see a car just sitting there. You can walk up to the VIN and tell exactly what make it is, what model, what price class, what year, where it was built, and what engine. The first letter B stands for the Barracuda lineup. The S means special price class. It just meant it was the performance version. So in this case, it's a Cuda. If it was a Barracuda, it would be a BH, Barracuda H, high price class, premium class, or in this particular case, a Cuda. The 23 means two door hard top. Or Jordan. Or Jordan, yeah. It also means Michael Jordan, that's right. I'll remember that. 35 years before he played the game. The next series is Victor Zero Echo. The Victor represents the engine. What engine is this again? It's a 446 pack. Mm. 446. I had so much hope for you. Six <laughs> barrel. Now I know everybody wonders, why does he get so excited about calling something the wrong name? The reason I'm a stickler is because of Yens out there. All of Yens, the keyboard commandos. And they do wait for you, they wait for you. It's not a six pack, it's a six barrel. You follow the facts. Everybody wants the facts and nobody wants the facts. What about that question? The zero is the last digit of the model year. What year is Arcuda? 70. Yep. And the E represents the assembly plant that the car was built at. Now for the E-body cars, they were built in two different assembly plants and only in two assembly plants. Hamtramck, Michigan, which was the main assembly plant. But because there was such an increase in volume of sales orders, for the E-bodies. They started building them at the Los Angeles plant as overflow. Now, as a result of this being an overflow plant, certain things were a little bit different. Now, I don't know, and nobody really does know exactly what the answer is, but there were no Hemi E-bodies built in Los Angeles. There were no convertible E-bodies built in Los Angeles. And for some reason, the broadcast sheets although there are a few that exist for LA cars, for the most part, it wasn't protocol to put them in the car. It was protocol to wad them up in a little ball or roll them into a, a doobie and smoke them. I don't know what they did. It was LA, it was the late 60s, early 70s, right? Puff the Magic Dragon ain't about no dragon. You know what I'm saying? Show me something. You might want to cut that because, just well, no, it's legal now. One, two, nine, five, two, eight. Okay, that's the serial number for the vehicle. It'll match the upper tie bar, it'll match the upper cow panel, and it'll match the door. It's not really a sales code, it's the serial number for the car. I'm about to put all the sub-assemblies together for our Daytona's nose cone. So I'm gonna start with the headlights, get the headlight buckets in there, and then I can actually put the doors in the actual housings. So I'm excited to see this thing basically reversed all getting put back together, to everything painted nice. When it comes to the NASCARs, the Daytona and the Superbird, there are a small group of people that forgot more about the exact correctness of these cars than I'll ever know. And, and frankly, even guys like Tony, you know, who is one of the most knowledgeable guys on the planet, second most knowledgeable guy on the planet. 
These guys and gals have dedicated an entire life to studying what happened on these cars, how they were built, what the protocol was. And then they don't just take that information, but they match that, they align that to a hundred Daytonas that they've seen that have never been disassembled so they can document it. So now in the Dodge Charger Daytona, it started life as a Charger RT. I know I've talked about this many times before. It was rolling down the assembly line as a Dodge Charger RT. It got plucked off the assembly line, sent over to Creative Industries and converted into a Daytona. That meant the hood and the fenders, which are 70s style on these cars, got plucked off of the car and it got a 70 fender, a 70 hood. It got 70 parts on the car. Now, all of these new parts that got put on the car had to be painted. It couldn't go back to the manufacturer and be painted. So the guys at Creative Industries painted the nose after it was converted and they painted the back window plug and deck lid because it was converted also to become a NASCAR. What that means is headlights were installed, trim, fasteners, ornamentation was installed at the time they painted the front end. Did they mask it off like you should? Did they take their time and make positive sure that everything was masked to perfection before they sprayed paint? No. So in the case of the owner of this car, he's seen it for 50 years with all those problems. He wants it done as right as we can do it. So when you see Justin putting these pieces together, each component has been taken apart, detailed, and looks brand new, like it should have been done had they not been in a hurry at Creative Industries to get these cars done. When you're talking about the nose cone on these, they are intricate. There is a lot of stuff. There's unique stuff, not just the fact that the nose cone is unique to a Daytona or the headlight doors, but there are also components inside that are the same ones that they did use on the assembly line. Each of these have to be correct. Even though the owner wants this to look better than it ever did, he wants it to have all of the original components and know that each and every one of those original components has been cleaned, detailed, blasted, lubricated, adjusted, and where it's supposed to be. So when you watch him put this together, every nut, every bolt is the correct fastener it started life with based on our documentation. Every hinge point movement is lubricated. Every wire is plugged in with dielectric grease to make sure that it has a good connection and it's pushed on all of the way. So while it takes a long time and it seems a bit tedious when you're at home watching them build out just a pair of headlight buckets, it has to be done that way and there's no way we can gloss over it. Because in the end, our job is to look better than it ever did at the manufacturer. I just got done putting the sub-assemblies together for our headlight doors and headlight housings. Everything went together really nice and it looks original. So the next step, now that we got these sub-assemblies done, is I can actually put these and mount them inside the actual nose cone itself. Some time back, we brought in a 1970 Dodge Challenger RTSC. Now, this is a B5 blue car, white top, blue interior. The non-numbers matching car, originally it was a 383 car. The owner bought it, it had a 440 in it. It's a non-HP 440. We made a deal for us to come up with a 440 HP block, which I did have, completely rebuild it to stock specs as though this car were a U-code car, when in reality, it's an N-code car go through the air conditioning system, detail everything under the hood, put it back together and ship it to them. Doug got all of the engine transmission built out. So our next step is to have Will painted the Hemi orange so it can get back over to Doug to get dressed out, married together with the transmission, all of the bolt-on parts and back in the car. So I have another engine to paint, which, you know, it's great, easy process. I like to sit on them for like a week or two. Doug brings you a part or a piece. He forgets to actually complete the process. I got 100 cars waiting in line behind the 20 engines that are in the shop. I'm backed up so far, it's like, you know what? Okay, I'm just human, you know, maybe I do miss a little bracket here or something, but I get it down to him and I never get it back again. Um, but with this one, we got good to go, looks great, it's in the booth. I have Noah, who's been dp 90 bare metal cars for like the past month. Pull him off of that, he jumps into the booth. Those engine blocks are bare metal. And if I just paint it, the paint's not gonna stick. So he just puts one really thorough coat, paints the whole thing black. That way, when I go to top coat it with the Hemi Orange, the paint will stick. And then I just mix up the EV2 Hemi Orange without the metallic, do two or three coats of that, and that thing looks good. Bake it and get it right back to Doug. 
Okay, TX9. TX9 means that it's black exterior. X9 always means black in the Mopars. So I believe it's called black velvet in the Plymouth lineup. I could be wrong on that, that's okay, but it's black. It's we a have solid a book. black. We don't need to be wrong. I on don't it. need to look at the book. I don't care what they call it, it's black. Now, when I say I'm a stickler, I'm a stickler when I know what I'm talking about. If I don't know what I'm talking about, why I gotta be a stickler? What engine is this again? It's a 446 pack. Mm. 446. That's so much hope for you. Six <laughs> barrel. The next sales code over has to do with the seats. Is it bucket seats or bench seats? So what is the code? H6X9. Very, very nice. H means a high price class. Okay, Six so means all vinyl buckets. And X9 is the color. What color is it? Black. Fruit of my going. The next code is the upper door frame paint. In this particular case, oh. what is the code? Zero, zero, zero. Zero, 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 that's right. So none? No, no. Okay. Zero, zero, zero is a sales code, and it means a one-piece interior door trim panel. The next series is when the scheduled production date of the car is 122. When you're talking about a scheduled production date, it gives you the month and the day. It doesn't give you the year, and here's why. A manufacturer's production schedule, in the case of Chrysler, begins on the first day of August and ends the last week of July of whatever year the car is being worked on. So for example, our 1970 Cuda, the very first day 1970 Plymouth model cars or Dodge cars were being built was August 1st, 1969. That's why you would see a 1970 Cuda in September of 69, because it could be built as early as August 1st, 1969. Now the last day that it could have been built, although we're not positive, we believe it was the last week of 1970, July. That gave them a week to get the manufacturer up to speed for the next model year. So what happens when you come to October, November, and December? When you represent them with the numbers, it's the 10th month, the 11th month, and the 12th month. You put the 10th month with a two-digit day, like say it was October 21st. That would be 1021, too many numbers for the three-digit allocation. So they call October A, November B, and December C. So now, if you have an October 10th scheduled production date, it would be A10. All right, next one is a shipping order number. 023064. Mm -hmm. That is an internal number that we really don't know how to uh, correlate to anything out here, but on the assembly line, it meant something. Now you're gonna find that on the broadcast sheet and only on the broadcast sheet. Jump back up to the next line, should be the upper body color. So TX9, we already, why is it there again? because this is the upper part of the body. If okay. it had a vinyl top, you might have a vinyl top code there. If it's all the same color paint, that's what they're telling okay. you right there. It's not a vinyl top, it's painted black. I don't even know why they print these books. They ought to just call me. <laughs> you screwed up. I'm time. sorry. I'm it's just to... listen, beats where's, a... where's Tony when you need him? I'm not oh, even Tony, you know, he's back eating. That's I where Tony it. at. Tony no, Eaton. Not. Nah, he's not. The next A33. one over is A33. That's a great code. A33 means track pack. It's an axle package car. It means it has a 3.54 to 1 Dana rear axle. A62. Uh, A62 is the rally instrument cluster. That's the cool wood grain, four big openings. It's got 150 mile an hour speedometer, 8,000 RPM tack hour from 70 to 71. 016? Uh, it's not a zero, it's a C like Charlie. That means it is a console option car. It has a console around the shifter. C55, it represents the bucket seats. That lets the guy on the assembly line know that he should punch some holes in the floor. G36. That represents the mirror. G36 sales code represents a left hand outside and right hand outside racing style mirror, painted body color. The left is remote and the right hand is manual. I'm not sure why. Even though Goldberg's car is coded for the right-hand outside mirror, for some reason, it's missing. J25. That would be your three-speed wipers, which is optional. That's why it's called a sales code. It's optional, but mandatory on a car with a shaker hood with cold air induction. Why? Because the air cleaner for the shaker hood is so big, the two-speed wiper motor sticks out like this and it would interfere. The two won't share the same space together. But a three-speed lays flush against the cowl, so you get that little extra bonus. You get a shaker, you get three-speed wipers. Whoop, whoop. J45. Our hood pin tie down, standard in the CUDA package. So we're running out of room, which means I'm running out of time. Okay, we got another page here. Nope. Let's go to the next one. Nope. 
in season seven, episode four, we restored this beautiful 1969 Roadrunner Hemi convertible painted in Q5. True or false, the correct name for Q5 in 1969 is Bright Turquoise. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. Welcome back, ghouls. How did we do on that one? You got to be paying attention. Now, this is this is stuff I've taught you over the years. If you answered true, you're absolutely wrong. It's actually called seafoam turquoise. Now, if it was a Dodge, like a Daytona in that color, it would have been called bright turquoise. In addition to being seafoam turquoise, this car had factory painted steel wheels. And of course, they're painted the Q5. They use a dog dish hubcap and red line tires. It is also an air grabber car, which is mandatory on all 426 Hemis and a factory replica exhaust system from our friends at ECS, along with bright exhaust tips. So two years ago, we met a really nice couple up at the uh, Little Creek Casino car show, uh, Jim and Laura. Now, Laura at the time, she said, when I was in high school, there was this really cool 1970 Cuda this kid had. I loved that car. It was lime green and the cam. Oh, I remember how it idled. It just, it rumbled and tumbled. And she had all these descriptions for what I believe was probably some monstrous camshaft in a 70 Cuda. So we visited for a little bit and as it went on, it turns out she wanted to have one of those cars built. She wanted one really bad, hasn't found one that matched exactly what she was looking for. So having seen the previous episodes of where we talked about Graveyard Dreams where you can order your car any way that you want it, we came to a, a deal where I would build her that car that she remembered from high school. So I'm getting ready to put the sound deadener in the 1970 Cuda. So from the factory, there is a certain amount of sound deadener that's put into the backing of the carpet. In today's world, we have products that really do work as a sound deadener, and we can put it on so many areas other than just the floor. We can put it on the insides of the doors, insides of the quarters, and at the end of the day, that probably kills 80% or more of the road noise that's coming through that car and engine noise when you're driving it down the road. J54. J54 calls out a sport hood. This is one of the anomalies. This is an anomaly. Do you know what an anomaly is? Something weird. This is one of those strange little anomalies that I don't understand, but here's what it is. The E-bodies were built at Hamtramck, Michigan and Los Angeles, California. Say this car was built at Hamtramck, Michigan. It would have N96 for a shaker hood, November 96 representing the cold air induction shaker hood. It would not have the J54, which is the sport hood, because you can't have two hoods on a car, right? So on a Hamtramck fender tag, there would be a call out for the N96 and only the N96. On the LA fender tag, they left the J54 sport hood, which was standard on the RT, and then later they added the N96. So if you have that fender tag and it has an N96, I guarantee you, that it is a shaker hood car. They wouldn't put the N96 on there accidentally, but they chose to leave the J54 on there. That's an example of how you can be slightly confused if you don't know exactly what you're looking at when decoding an LA fender tag. M21. M21 is your molding package. That would be your drip rail moldings or drip trough moldings. Those are your stainless steel moldings that go along the upper roof gutter. M25. M25 are your rocker or sill moldings. In this case, a CUDA standard equipment, and they are a plastic fiberglass. Well, the repos are fiberglass. Imagine the original ones are a form of plastic. What's your next M31. one? M31s went ahead with the belt moldings. We call those belt moldings. When you roll the window down, you put your arm outside because yeah. you're cruising the gut looking for chicks. Nope. Well, you did, and they were called belt moldings. M88. Those are unique to the CUDA. Well, the, the sales code's not, but it's the rear body moldings or taillight panel moldings. Either one works fine. We N41. N41 means that it is dual exhaust, mandatory with all 440 engines. N85. Factory tachometer, 8,000 RPM, also included in the A62 Rally instrument cluster. The 95. N95? Yeah. Evaporative emissions. This car must have been sold in California. It has evaporative emissions. 
So in this particular case, it means that there's another vent on the fuel tank that's connected to a hose that runs to the front of the car. And what that fuel line does is it follows all the way along with the other fuel lines on the right-hand side underneath the car, then works its way up to the top of the inner fender on the right-hand side, where you would connect a hose from that line over to the carburetor itself. In this case, six barrel would be the center carburetor. The extra vapors that go through that carburetor, theoretically, go through that tube and back down into the tank. It's an early emission system. N96. N96 means it's a shaker hood, which cancels. The sport hood, J54. J54, that's right. Okay, so N97. Noise reduction package. So in this particular case, what N97 stands for is that instead of through the pan, bright, beautiful exhaust tips, like the car has on it now, from the factory, they were turndowns. They didn't want that noisy car, probably because it was destined to be a California car, and they had laws there that were more restricted than any other state in the union. So if you have N97, I guarantee you, you will never see N42 bright exhaust tips on a fender tag. Can't share the same space. R35. R35, very cool. R35 <clears throat> is an AM FM. I realize those are standard on today's cars, but back then it was an option. AM FM. So you just didn't get a radio? Stereo. No, standard was an AM radio, which was R11. Oh, okay. But you could have got an AM8 track, which would be R22, or an AM FM, which is R35. Why 14? Means the car was sold. Somebody ordered that car and it was sold. Mm -hmm. 26 means that it had a 26 inch radiator. And then end. Means it's the end of the sales code. In some cases, a car will have multiple fender tags, two or in some cases, three fender tags. If that wasn't there, you'd be asking, where's the other fender tag? Because these sales codes are going on to the other fender uh, tag. Oh, like it's when we had the two. So loaded, it's gotta have more. But in this case, it's saying, now nah, you're done, Jack. If this was a two fender tag car, instead of the word END being at the end of the first tag, it would have CTD continued. Then you'd know there's a tag missing, but it has the additional sales codes that wouldn't fit on the original fender tag. Okay. There nice. you go. Nice, look at that. Fender yeah. tag decode 101. Do you have any questions of me, counselor? None. Nope. We're I have good. a greater responsibility than you could possibly fathom. You weep right, for well, Santiago. Good, you curse the Marines. God. You have that luxury. You had the luxury of not knowing what I know, that while Sonny I liked it the first 10 times. Death Thank you. Was tragic. I'm gonna go and type it this out saved for you. Lives. I'll leave it on your desk or give it and to well, Justin or do something. my okay. is grotesque. Good talk. So the car Will's getting ready to paint is our 1969 Charger RTSE 444 speed. Only a handful of these cars made. It's a T5 car. It's a, a tan, which really is a copper. It's a beautiful car. Black top, black interior. It's an SE, so it has leather seats. This was an exceptional, really nice quality car to start with. It wasn't rotten beyond words. The motor was broken. It had major problems. But overall, all numbers matching, original fender tag, original dash, all body numbers match. So Will is getting ready to lay the final paint out on that now. We have this gorgeous charger. It's the first time we've ever done this dark tan color. Um, it's, it's called tan, but it's, it's more of a brown metallic. Not only are we you know, doing a final paint on the car, which is always exciting and intense and stressful, so trying to deal with a pandemic, deal with fire season, trying to still do cars, hard to breathe. I mean, these are real problems that we're dealing with right now that just make something that's already tense just pretty much over the top here at the shop for not just me, but everybody else that works here. And it's the little things you don't think about. Even having to go out there and pressure wash a car, it's a pain in the butt because there's no clean air. There's no clean air anywhere right now. So just the simplest tasks are magnified by 10. Mark pretty much did the whole entire pre-paint on this car on weekends. Pre-paint, it looked okay. It wasn't, wasn't anything to write home about. You put the car together, his clear coat didn't look that good, but that's okay, he's getting older. Get the car put together, get it in the booth. It's all blocked down, masked up. Couple little issues we had to address that Mark had missed, but that's why we're a team. I was able to pick up the slack. That is absurd. That's absolutely absurd. Okay, my pre-paints are better than Will's final paints. So he can say what he wants to, and it's all easy after the fact. Well, I fixed this little thing, I fixed that. You didn't fix anything. You didn't fix anything. 
If that car comes out nice, it's because I prepaid it. Not because you, Mr. Second Day Armchair Quarterback, came in and saved the day, because you don't do that. All right. You know, it's one of the last prepaints that we've, we're doing because we're just going right to final paint now and just spending a little more attention to detail, spending a little more time on them. But the car's in the booth and it just looks the part. Now, one thing on this car is this is a T5 car. There are actually three shades of the tan. There is T3, T5, and T7. And it starts in the basement with T3 being the lightest shade of a given color. And then the T5 would be the medium shade, even though they call it dark tan. And then the T7 would be the very darkest of the shades. It did take three days to paint. That, that, that was real. What is the deal with three days to paint? It's already been pre-painted. It's prepped, it's washed, it's cleaned, it's masked. Three days? Three days to seal it, to base coat it, and to clear coat it? Why not build it an advent calendar like you're building up for Christmas? You go in there, you get five or six coats of color. It's kind of transparent, not too bad, but you spend one day just dropping color on it. I used to do all of that in an afternoon and still get home in time to drink some beers and watch Cheers. There's another rhyme for you. Drink some beers and watch some Cheers. I just wanted to let it sit, no rush. Had Mark come in the next day just to do like a, a once over on it. Found a couple things he didn't like, uh, which is great to have a second set of eyes on it. Address those issues, spent the second day dropping color on it. <laughs> Finally came in that third day, walked around the car, everything just looked perfect. Clear coated it. We use the PPG DCU 2021, which is a polyurethane clear. It's a very thick clear, lays down good, cut and buffs great, holds a great shine, great product from start to finish. The car is amazing. It's one of, one of the better cars that we've done here. So I'm super excited to get this thing buffed, get it over to assembly, get that black top on with the black stripe and get it out of here. So when I started the shop here uh, on Catherine Street, when you guys remember it was a big vacant building, we kind of built it out to where we wanted it. I had the opportunity to go from just having an air compressor, which is what we've normally done in the past, to an air system. And that's what we put in was a complete air system. And I've loved it because it's been infallible. It's been uh, flawless. It has a dehydrator, so it takes all the moisture out of the airlines. And it's been just an old workhorse. Up until we got one of the compressors went down and wouldn't start. If you would look around outside, you thought it was an eclipse. I mean, it was dark. It was brown. You couldn't see anything. So you know how hard that is on our lungs. Now you're a compressor trying to get fresh air in. That's what kicked the code. That's what caused it not to work. And then we spring this weird leak in the system, this high-pitched squeal. And this pitch, this high pitch that drives you bananas, if you're walking through the shop, if you're walking north, it sounds like it's on the right-hand side. If you're walking south, it sounds like it's on the left-hand side. It telegraphs all over the place. I can't tell where it's coming from. Now, Kaiser doesn't have anything to do with the airlines. They just make the compressors. And they took it upon themselves, because they have the sonic equipment, to look for it and help us find it. They have a sonic gun. This little sonic gun, it goes around the shop, and they just point it at the line, and they chase it all the way down the line. And if it picks something up, ever so slight, ever so slight, it'll point you over there in that direction. Then you can go over there with some soap and water and look for the leak. So it took them maybe 45 minutes to finally come up with the culprit, which was a saddle gasket at one of our unions in our airline over on the west side of the building. Thank goodness, because that would make a person crazy. We have a 1970 GTX 446 barrel car. It's a really neat car. It's EF8 green. It's an automatic air grabber car. It was here just to have the body and paint work done. The owner is going to take it home with the body and paint done and finish assembling the car. So after assessing all the damage to the inner structure, I know that to be able to make a pull, I've got to get that quarter panel and some other pieces out of the way. So I'm cutting George loose to get going on the dissection of all the metal that's going to be replaced. Good job, Georgie. Thank so, you. It is completely free? Yes. Okay. I got a cart over there. Let's set it on that. Oh, 
Look at that. Oh, that ain't pretty. Oh my. You work on this car back in the 70s? Uh, no, wasn't thought of that by then. Hmm, what year were you born? 84. Very lucky, all right. Let's put this quarter panel on. So where we're at on our GTX, the quarter panel has been dissected off of the car. Now we've saved that panel because there may be pieces on it we need to use for a future car. So don't throw anything away unless it's complete garbage. You'll see that the trunk floor extension area has been dissected apart from the floor itself. The rear body panel dissected off of the quarter panel. The inner wheelhouse is ready to have the outer wheelhouse married onto it. So all of this area that you see right here has been prepped out and ready to make the pulls. And in fact, you even see that we have the pull mechanism set up into place. So this is like an onion. Once you pull that first layer off, you can see what's underneath it. The quarter inner structure, this is where the window regulator bolts on. It was damaged in this previous accident. I wanted it off of there so we could do a proper repair, number one, to the panel, and number two, make the correct pull without having to worry about damaging that. The quarter reinforcement area where the window regulators bolt in, that has been surgically removed. We have to do work to it to be able to reinstall it back in there. But right now, what you're seeing is an area that's ready to make pulls. Now, if you look carefully at the pulling area, this is all stoved in. This area is damaged considerably. So we have welded a quarter inch plate onto there. So at this point, we are ready to begin making our very first pull. We're just gonna start putting some pressure on that. And you watch that tower come back. See that tower coming back right there? Now you see it starting to tighten up. That's a real weak area, so I don't expect a ton of pulling out of there. There it goes. And there it went all the way, broke loose. So, okay, so now we can get that outer rocker, which is just basically thin 18 gauge sheet metal, cut that out of the way now. Once we get it out of the way, we'll be able to dissect and clean our way right down to the inner rocker, which also needs to be replaced, and that floor section. Once we get in there, we can weld another tab on and make a direct pull on that floor. So I'm gonna cut George loose to start removing sheet metal off this car. Back in season seven, episode four of Graveyard Cars. We did a beautiful restoration on this 1969 Roadrunner convertible factory 426 Hemi in Q5 Seafoam Turquoise. Was the transmission behind that engine a four-speed manual transmission, three-speed manual, or automatic transmission? If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. We've been making this show now for 11 years. That means there is a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor that I think is good quality stuff that we shot. Some of it antiquated, maybe by today's standards, but still really good and informational. So that leads me to this. About six years ago, I got a telephone call from a guy who said he had a 68 440 HP engine and transmission out of a GTX, I believe, that he wanted to sell. I'm always interested in buying parts and we can always use them for something. Yeah. That manifold was cast just a little bit before the engine was assembled. Yeah. So not bad. Yeah, not bad at all. It's kind of like a scavenger hunt when you're in these places. So you got your engine, you got the transmission, that's pretty easy, but what about the other pieces? Is that an 070? Yep, see that 070 right there? Yeah. Yep. Tony D'Agostino makes these. If you look at his original, his reproductions, it's an identical twin to that one right oh, there. Nice. So when you go into these situations, common sense says if they took those out, they took other things out. So I just looked around a little bit. You look in these little corners and you see like the original Carter carburetor there. 60, uh, it's a 68, it was the ninth month of 68, and it's a 4682. Nice. Yeah, good. Wow, that's amazing. That's a two or three hundred dollar core carburetor in today's world. If that was a 70 Hemi Cuda and you were looking for date coded original carburetors, you could pay five thousand dollars for a pair of them. That's the original base. Yeah. Mm hmm. Looks like the beauty rims. Yeah, had Magnum 500s on it, or road wheels, they call them. That's probably a pretty car. So even back then, scavenger hunting meant look for everything. 
find the bell housing, find the pieces that don't mean anything to them anymore, but you know you're gonna be looking for them. So I never regret going on a good scavenger hunt, because at the end of the day, you usually get more than you went out for. It's bought from Payless. <laughs> Oh, back when you could buy them? Okay, $3.99 for a filter. That yeah. was Kmart. over on uh, Olympic. Yeah. Is there a Kmart one there? Yeah, yeah there's a Kmart one here, too. Oh, somewhere. that's great. That's there my old stomping right ground. There. Now, Royal, if you ever get a chance to meet Royal, ask him about his Kmart oil filter. <laughs> Mark tells it like he was there, but he wasn't. How could I tell a story over and over again for 35 years that never happened? That would make me crazy. And last time I checked, I'm not crazy. He walked all the way from 7th and ENF, all the way over to Olympic Street to Kmart, got the filter, walked all the way back, went to back the car out, set the filter on the ground, and ran it. over it. Trying to get lined up, I backed up and I felt I ran over something, so I looked out and saw that it was my oil filter that I spent my last $1.99 on. You know, I was 16. Wow. $1.99 was a lot of money back then. I could have bought several big gulps. We wanted to punish him. Yeah. We've all wanted to do yep. that. Sometimes we'll just cuss ourselves oh, out. Yeah. Not Royal. Yeah, he went the extra step. No, Royal went the extra step to go up to the garage. Oh, no. And and he found the corner and <laughs> looked at it and he goes, yeah, that's that's a good... Oh, that's, God. That's going to do it. Bye-bye. He even did a couple of um, trial shots at it, like this. And right about time before I said, sweet Royal, don't, boom. And to this day, that whole thing dips down. <laughs> he has no... Uh, but that made him feel okay about running over his filter. I can, now I can pull my finger out of socket. So I went in and told my mom, I said, I think I broke my finger. She said, watch your mouth, and then saw what I was talking about, so she took me to the hospital. The best part for me was the 40 cc's of Demerol they gave me. I didn't care about the finger. I either witnessed that with my own two eyes, or I am absolutely 100% insane. So you guys be the judge. Do I seem insane to you? So I was able to buy the engine and the transmission and the extra little pieces that went with it, which is great because here we are, I think it's five or six years later, I've used them. I used them in a 68 GTX that I did that needed a date coded engine. I actually used them and they made that car whole again. So that's great. All right, ghouls, how did we do on that one? Our 1969 Plymouth Roadrunner 426 Hemi convertible. What transmission was behind it? If you said a four-speed manual, you're absolutely wrong again. Gotta hand that guy some money sitting next to you. Why ain't you watching the show? This car was an automatic transmission, D32. Now, it could have been a four-speed, really would have made it rare but it no way in the world could have been a three-speed. It just wasn't available with a 426 Hemi. In addition to being a 426 Hemi automatic, it had black vinyl interior, a power black convertible top, black bucket seats with headrests, full Roadrunner badging, and power windows, P31. Well, it's certainly nice that we got our compressors up and running and we got the air leak fixed. It hasn't changed a whole lot as far as from a smoke standpoint, so I don't even know for sure if it's going to end up kicking the, the alarm off again on the compressor. And that smoke is so bad, the fact that they knocked the compressor out, I've been here my entire life, and it's the worst it's ever been. So hopefully that clears up, we get some rain, put the fires out, and we can get back to life as normal as it was before that.